Bart Nunley has been a resident of the western Kentucky town of Henderson his whole life. He's an author and cryptid investigator who's recently written about his encounters and others in his latest book called Mysterious Kentucky, focusing on the strange and unexplained phenomena that hides itself inside the bluegrass state. For Bart, it all started after he and his family had their own personal horrific encounters in 1975. That year is when things changed drastically for the Nunley family, as their quiet country home and farm in Spotsville, Kentucky, was the target of almost a year-long attack by more than one of these mysterious hairy creatures, now locally referred to as the Spotsville Monster. It's been over 35 years ago, and I remember like it was, was yesterday. But what I remember most was the fear that we all felt when these things came around. For Bart Nunley, this is where it all started. His childhood home used to be located right here. Just a vacant lot now, but decades later, his family still remembers the terrifying nights they experienced with what is now known as the Spotsville Monster. And those memories haunt them to this day, which is the reason Bart has been on a decades-long search to find the truth. There were several times that my family saw this creature in broad daylight, but it was usually at night is just when they would be more active and come up and they would they would just come up and rattle our doors and look in our windows, you know, and, and walk around our house and just, just scare the hell out of everybody. The area in which the Nunnelys lived during these encounters was very secluded. Once rich with fruit trees, wild strawberries, and the Green River nearby for water, it provided near perfect conditions for almost anyone or anything to sustain itself. And at the same time, still remain elusive. It was just a really, a really scary situation because when, once it got going, it was almost every night these things would come up and terrorize our family. The reason that we were also scared is no one knew what it was, you know. Uh, we didn't have any idea about Bigfoot back then. I was nine years old, never heard of Bigfoot, and neither had my father. Bart's mother, Rosalie Jenkins, recalls an encounter that happened one night when her daughter-in-law was getting her grandkids from their house trailer next door. We had this big dust to dawn light out there beside the house, and I just happened to look over there and there was this thing standing right directly under that light. But this had, uh, his face looked kind of like a leather or something, you know? But its hair was, uh, its arms was long and it, it was tall and it was covered with, it looked like dark brown hair, of course. It was night, but he was under that light. Of course, I screamed. <laughs> And uh, she, uh, I told her, I said, hurry up and get them kids over here, Jackie. I said, there's something out there. Well, she got the kids over there, and I, I seen it several times after that. It was running down the road over a fence there by the barn, and it was, I would say, every bit of eight foot tall. And that's not exaggerating at all, and it was covered with hair. And, but it was just standing there looking over at us. Bart's brother, Dean, also had an encounter that he'll never forget. After being sent to get his younger sister and niece for dinner, the ploy to scare them back inside the house backfired. And I heard a bunch of limbs breaking coming through the woods, like something coming through the woods, some large coming through the woods. And it kind of gave me the idea to try to scare them a little bit, you know. So I was told them, I said, look, here comes, the, here comes this Bigfoot, y'all better come on. Come on, let's go in the house. Well, it didn't work. And all of a sudden, everything got real quiet. And I looked over to the edge of the woods, and he, he was standing right in a little gully, right outside of the woods, just standing there watching us. And uh, I, I tried to holler out, but my vocal cords had done shrunk up. And I, I ran in the house, and, and I had to pull on Mom, and I couldn't, couldn't even speak. I was so scared. Uh, she, they said I was white as a sheet. Of course, I did end up getting the kids in, but and didn't bother anybody or, or the kids. It would be just standing there, just standing there watching them. About eight or nine, maybe 10 foot tall, large man, broad shouldered, covered in long hair, kind of a reddish brownish color. And it was, I, could, I could see that it was, some of the hair was gr turning gray, like an older animal. You know, it a, had a grayish tint to it in places. But you know what the police told, state police told me? When they come out there and was checking around and everything, said they thought it was a bear. I said, it's not a bear. I know what bears look like. 
he said, and uh, he said, well, I guess you know now. I said, it's against the law to shoot a bear. I said, I guess you know. I don't care what it is. If it comes through that back door after me or my kids or husband, I'll shoot it. Soon after, the encounters took a grisly turn. The family started to notice their farm animals turning up dead. It killed over 250 of our chickens, a horse, a goat. Uh, just It killed everything but our dogs, and our dogs were... They were really vicious dogs, but when this thing would come up, they would run underneath the house where it couldn't reach them. So what happened was this thing had, was killing other people's dogs and bringing them up to our property and just dropping them on our property so we would find them, which was really strange. But they were, every one of them was uh, curiously mutilated. They, the meat wasn't eaten. It looked like they were surgically uh, opened up. Uh, the stomach cavity was in, empty. All the, the entrails were gone. The eyeballs were missing and so were the tongues, but other than that, they were untouched. And so whatever this thing was, it wasn't killing these things to eat them. It was, it was taking their, their entrails and soft tissue. It didn't take long for word to spread of what was going on around the Nunley's property. Eventually, the local newspapers got wind of the story. This article ran in the Henderson Gleaner about the 1975 attacks. The publicity didn't generate any answers for the Nunley's, but instead generated an overwhelming amount of ridicule. It's just remarkable, and I guess you can understand how a lot of people may look at this subject. Sure. And have a very hard time. Sure. Believing that there's actually anything going on. Sure, but not once you've you know, once not, you've lived it yourself, Chris, you know you don't you know that becomes a moot point because you know what you've seen, you know what you experienced, you know that it's real. So everyone else not believing it doesn't bother you as much. Sure, you like you like for everyone to know the truth, but you know it's. Like you say, most people can't believe in something like this unless they've seen it theirself. According to Bart, not even the police were able to help. Luckily, the Nunnellys weren't alone, though. A neighbor had also encountered this mysterious creature and knew all too well what the Nunnellys were going through. My dad started to call the uh, state police to come out and, you know, help us out and maybe escort us off the property. And they would come out with their sirens blaring and their, you know, their, their lights flashing and the creature would just slip back into the woods until they were gone and then come back out. After uh, five or six calls, the, the police stopped responding to our calls. They wouldn't come out and help us anymore. But luckily, my dad had met a man that had just had a, a run-in with this creature and they lived really close to us and his name was Roy and he would start calling him whenever we had problems and he would come out and, and help us. It was a not a pleasant time because nobody would believe what was down there unless you actually went down there. Roy is not this man's real name. He's asked to be anonymous because of the criticism he's already gotten from people that he shared his story with. Roy spends a lot of time in the woods surrounding his Spotsville home. He enjoys hunting the most and has spent countless hours in deer stands looking for the premier buck. So he's very familiar with the animals that are native to this region of Kentucky. But what he claims he saw, along with Bart's family, doesn't match anything that's supposed to exist. Uh, actually, the very first time I saw it, it was in a, inside of an old building. And uh, I had circling around the outside of the building just looking for stuff on the ground to see if there was any tracks or anything. And I noticed it was inside the building. So I was looking through an opening in, the old, old, in an old building, looking through the opening, and it was standing right there in front of me. And this is a part I have never ever I'll never forget it, and I don't know how to describe it, other than it just disappeared. I was looking dead at it, had a shotgun, loaded shotgun in my arms and my hands, and I had no time to even point if, if I was going to shoot it, okay? There was, no, there was no time and no availability of me to even turn the gun to squeeze the trigger. It just disappeared, and I thought, where'd it go? And the first thing I did was I... After I got my senses back, I walked all the way around that building and I couldn't find anything. What was found? This plaster cast taken from a footprint that was believed to be from the creature. Roy was one of few who believed the Nunnally story since he, after all, had seen the mysterious creature himself. He recalls one night when the police were called again to the Nunnally's property. The second encounter we had with the police down there, in fact, they had come up there and told me to stay the hell out of the bottoms. And that was their exact word. And they brought a game warden out and said, if it's a bear, after the story of the bear came out, he come out and he told me, he said, you either leave the bear alone if it is a bear, just leave everything alone, or I'm going to prosecute you and we'll find you and make, make an example out of you. 
And so they told me basically stay away from down there. Well, that wasn't going to happen because there wasn't anybody helping them. And nobody, I mean, how would you feel if your family's down there and you've got a whole bunch of kids and your wife and you and the kids are all scared to death every night and there's not but one person shows up to take care, take your part or believes you or anything else and the police are not going to do anything. According to Roy, the police were just there to keep everybody quiet. And a perfect example of that, and I'll tell you, I'll say it on tape, because I've told Bart about this before. I was down there one night, and I had left my truck way up the road so that they wouldn't know I was down there, and walked a good distance down to the house. And uh, I had gotten down there, and it was just getting about to get dark. And here come the police cruiser coming down the road, and a state trooper right behind him. And I hadn't, I didn't know at the time I got there, they had called and reported something going on out in the building, out around the buildings there. And uh, so anyway, I told him, I said, listen, I'm going to go out back here and I'm going to hide and while, till, while they're here because I'm not, if I get caught down here, they're going to prosecute me. And your dad, Red, said, yeah, go ahead. And, and so I slipped out in the woods and I laid out there in the woods not 40 yards from where those police officers, I could hear them real good from the back porch. And uh, they had told Red, well, we're going to go out here with our lights and stomp around the woods and see if we shake up anything. They could have found me if they'd really went in the woods, okay, because I wasn't that far from them. And I laid there and was motionally still down alongside a log and listened to their conversation. They walked into the woods, lit up a cigarette, one of them did, stood there and said, well, let me smoke this cigarette and then we'll go back and tell them we've looked all over this place. And that was the exact words. And I knew from that, on, that time on, there was no way I was going to leave these people by themselves. With the lack of help from the police and any true answers as to what these creatures were, Bart decided to get the answers on his own. Now, over 30 years after the initial encounters, Bart has written about his investigations into the creature in several books, such as Bigfoot in Kentucky. Through his investigations and research, he has found other eyewitnesses that have had their own terrifying encounters with the Spotsville monster. Basically, in every part of Henderson County, these things have been seen and people have encountered them uh, every, in every part of Henderson County. So, it's not just in Spotsville. We have reports from Hebbardsville, from Geneva, from Cardin, uh, Uniontown, you know, that it's, it's all over this place for some reason. Near Owensboro, Kentucky, just north of Barn Harbor Hills, Josh Morris encountered the creature on two different occasions. All right, well, uh, back about 2005, I um, helped my uncle clean out a tree line over here and uh, sitting out in the middle of the field on the tractor. And all of a sudden, over the roar of his bulldozer, I hear, this god-awful roar come from out of the ravine up behind me. I look over, I see about three or four deer, I see rabbits, raccoons, everything just come bolting out of this ravine. Uh, just something just scared the hell out of them. And uh, about five, ten minutes later, I just start getting this weird feeling. And I look over, and there's the abandoned barn right over here, and standing in the doorway of it is just probably eight or nine foot tall creature just had his arm up hanging up on the beam of the door just kind of leaning out watching us and he did stood there for about half an hour doing that and afterwards i went over to the barn door to see how tall it was because his head was right at the top of it that barn door is probably about that tall and so i knew i knew this was something big what do you think personally that this thing is i think it's a bigfoot and i think there's more i'm pretty sure there's more than one of them up in here what's your personal theories to why no one's been able to get a picture of it or there's been no remains found and it's it's so elusive I think you know they they know what we are and you know what we try to do they know we hunt um, and I think they they do their best to just steer clear of us uh, and just to stay away from us and they're just extremely elusive what people see and hear what the public knows is not necessarily all there is to know about these things. People do have evidence, but for one reason or another, they're not coming forward and uh, letting other people see it. As far as physical evidence goes, uh, I have a buddy in Hebbardsville, Kentucky, who claims to have such physical evidence uh, in the form of a tooth. Well, to the native people, I mean, we've, we've been watching them and staying out of their way for uh, 7,000 years, maybe more. Chief Mike Manfox Bewley now lives on the same land where his Cherokee ancestors once thrived centuries ago.
We are Southern Cherokee Nation of Kentucky. Uh, we were recognized by Governor John Y. Brown here in 1893 as an Indian tribe. And we've been here ever since. We were here before the removal, but after the Civil War, we came back to Kentucky from Oklahoma. Uh, in the 1700s, this was called the Great Hill. And it was a place where the Cherokee lived. And uh, they had a long house up here for the holy men. And this valley was all full of uh, village. And there's places where the sentries stood and everything like that. Chief Buley's ancestors left their marks on the land, mainly in the form of grave markers made of sandstone that have so far withstood the elements of nature and time and can still be found throughout the Great Hill today. Uh, we have uh, Chief Doublehead, he's buried here. Uh, his daughter, uh, Dragging, I mean, uh, Corn Blossom, she's buried here. And there's a Troxel baby that's buried here. But there's all kind of stones with just hieroglyphic writing on them all up and down this hill. The Southern Cherokee Nation meets regularly on these very sacred lands. When we visited, we were welcomed as guests of their fall harvest celebrations. The Native American people hold their heritage within their hearts and their blood, and they keep their lineage alive, not so much with pictures, but with words. We were told stories that have been passed down for generations about mysterious creatures that once shared these woods with the Native people, and some believe they still do to this very day. Um. Well, when I was very, very young, you know, I'd heard stories from my grandfather and stuff about them, uh, where they came and got my great-grandfather's hogs and carried them off across the fence, you know, or wood rail fence. They just stepped over it with two hogs under each arm. And uh, there was another interesting part about that. When he was, uh, the next day, they, him and my grandfather went out hunting, uh, trying to find the hogs. Well, what they'd found was a panther that was down the trail and its back legs were crushed where it grabbed by the back legs and just slammed it up against the tree till it beat it to death. And then as I was growing up, I uh, got more interested and he showed me places where you could go sit and watch them. And we call them the old people of the forest. This tooth was found on the land of the Southern Cherokee Nation near Spotsville. Chief Buley believes this to be biological evidence of what they refer to as the old people of the forest. But could this really be concrete evidence of the existence of the creature people have claimed to see in these parts of Kentucky that they now refer to as the Spotsville Monster? I've had it checked out. Uh, Nears, we can tell it doesn't match anything that's normal or, or from this country. And we had a specialist look at it and he said it, he couldn't identify it at all. And he studied African animals and stuff like that. So we have a tooth from a creature that, and this tooth's not petrified. So it's not that old, you know, so it's just one that they lost. Have you had anyone do any DNA testing on it? No, right I've never let anybody grind on it or cut on it in any way. I didn't want to damage it in any way. But they have, they have took very well good photos and, and examined them and specialists say, doesn't fit anything that we've ever seen. A possible tooth from this creature isn't the only piece of what Chief Buley believes is evidence. He also claims to have captured vocal sounds from the creature as well. I've even got some verbal sounds that I recorded of them, and uh, the dogs wouldn't even bark. <laughs> you know, they're, they're scared to death. You hear them? Yeah. Yeah.
not necessarily a distress call, but what did it, do you think it was just them communicating? I I know they had young there. The male might have been wanting to mate, but they try and keep them away while they still got little young. So it was a little barking back at each other. And how close do you think that was to your actual house here? Oh, um, no more than uh, probably 50, 60 feet. They were right over there in them trees. About 20 yards? Yeah. Did you find anything the next day, any prints or anything like that? No. I'll tell you what, these suckers can tiptoe across the ground and never leave a mark. Wow. It's unbelievable. Well, hopefully we'll if, you find, if you find a footprint, it's where they misstepped and they stepped in some mud or whatever, and you'll find one. But they're really very careful what they do. I've even seen places where there were track marks and they take brush and rake, rake it. So they, they don't want to be tracked. So these things seem to be very intelligent then. Oh yeah, yeah. They know exactly what they're doing, you know, and they can read fear on you too, you know, and which that's the thing, the thing they want. They want you to be scared, you know. We took high definition video of this mysterious tooth to University of Louisville archaeologist Dr. Phil de Blasi to get his opinion on what creature this tooth may have come from. Right, that's the, the tooth that was found in Spotsville, Kentucky by uh, some members of the uh, Cherokee Nation there in that part of Kentucky. Uh, and the context is it was found in a field, it was, it was found... found in an offering place in the, in the woods there. There's a place where the Native Americans, when they come through, okay. they, they leave offerings and so forth. That's important because context is, is, is part of, part of uh, how we ascertain where something came from. Um, and this tooth has a very unusual uh, enamel pattern on it um, um, and even if you look at human dentition our molars have a lot of pointed surfaces because they're grinding teeth this is more a tearing or a cutting teeth cutting tooth of, of uh, medium to large mammal but not the kind of mammal people have reported seen in the Spotsville area of Western Kentucky so what is it from? So the first thing I really thought about was pig, and I thought somewhere in this area of the dentition. And unfortunately, at this lab, we just don't have a good, mature pig. All we have is this young guy here. I also looked at things like, if you look at, this is white-tailed deer. Okay, nothing. You see, this is an animal that eats, it's solely a grazer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so look at the cusp pattern. See? This is the area of, of teeth that we're talking about, are these little premolars that are situated here. And again, the ones that are, are the real important ones are the ones that's mm -hmm. missing. But you see how the roots start forking? That's yeah. what you've got. Okay. You've got a, you do not have any of this front teeth. So the, the nearest I can come to, I mean, seriously, is pig. So is this tooth found in Western Kentucky on Southern Cherokee Nation land, that of a wild pig? Without DNA evidence, there's no true fire way to determine what creature it came from. Not far away from the land of the Southern Cherokee Nation is the home where Shelly Garza grew up. She hasn't lived there in years, but still has vivid memories of her encounters as if it were just yesterday. Our horses was down in that area, and at night when this thing, I guess, would get close enough, it would agitate them, and they would jump, they would run, they run up to a neighbor's house, they would neigh, they would claw at the ground. There's something here, something here. Do you remember what the facial features looked like on this creature? It looked like a man. It wasn't an ape looking thing, it wasn't, but it was real hairy. In more recent years, the sightings have continued. Bart has been receiving eyewitness reports on a fairly regular basis. One such report came in from a young man who claims to have come eye to eye with this very creature. Okay, we're driving out here to Cardin, Kentucky, uh, still Henderson County. We're going to talk to a young man named Sam who had an encounter with this creature a couple of years ago and got some really good physical evidence in the form of a track cast that he made. Sam isn't this young man's real name. He too was afraid of being ridiculed and wanted to remain anonymous. 
We've also altered his voice at his request. Tell me about your sighting again, when it happened and basically the, what, what happened to you. Well, it was, um, <clears throat> it was the winter of 2012. Um, I was working out in the woods and I saw this black figure sitting on a fallen down tree. Um, its head was looking up the hill next to it. And it was about um, maybe a few hundred feet away from me. I could see its head turning and it had its hand up to its mouth, acting like it was eating something. And it would occasionally look up the hill every now and then. But then um, I stepped back a moment to, uh, you know, brace myself because there's snow on the ground. And when I did that, um, it turned its head towards me and I could see the light shining uh, from its eyes. And um, we stood there from what, what seemed like forever. And um, I stared at it and it stared at me. Um, it just seemed to be too long of a stare off, so I just walked back backwards, keeping my eyes on it, and I got out of there as quickly as possible, came back home. Okay, what we have here is a, actually a couple of impressions that he made, him and his mother. And this one here appears to be a handprint. Is that, is that what you would, would agree with that? Okay, and this one here would be the footprint. Is that right? Mm -hmm. As you can see, they're they're pretty big. Uh, the footprint's really wide. The handprint is really big. You can see that the fingers are bigger than mine. So you see here that the handprint's about uh, almost 11 inches long, and the footprint is about nine and a half, ten inches long. Now, where did you, where exactly did you take these impressions at? Um, they're on our um, plot back beyond the house. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to walk back there and maybe take a, a couple pictures of where this actually happened. Would that be okay? That would be. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Okay, can you can you point out the exact location where you got the uh, footprint and handprint impressions and uh, where you actually saw this creature? The footprint was right here between these two trees down here on the slower hill. Um, the handprint was back that way in the woods a little way. And then the creature was down here at the base of the hill on the far side. You can see this place is really, really grown up and it's uh, one of the biggest thickets I've seen in a long time. Even though we're right on the outskirts of Henderson City, you can see this uh, place is really it's really thick and almost impenetrable in places, so I don't have any problems believing that uh, one of these creatures could be out here in hiding at any given time. These are pictures of the footprint and the handprint cast made on Sam's property. Are these casts made from prints of a yet unknown primate creature? Or are they just prints from known animals and have just been misidentified? No one so far has been able to prove them fake or genuine. Lonnie Hawks is an independent Kentucky Bigfoot researcher. He's been hunting for evidence of the Spotsville monster now for over 10 years. Henderson, Kentucky, it's in, in my opinion, the number one spot in the world to research. Some of his best evidence has been found in and around the Green River State Forest area in western Kentucky. Bart talked with him about his finds there. Okay, Lonnie, uh, can you give us a little background on how you obtained this recording that you have and where you obtained it? Well, 2013, during deer season, we'd actually been down here researching and stuff because of people hunting and doing, the, you know, leaving their gut piles and the animals they killed. That we'd actually research this area all year long, and we'd been down here hearing noises and stuff and, and recordings and stuff. And we'd actually come down here one night, and it was about 11:30, 12 o'clock at night, when we'd actually recorded this sound that was, two, it was approximately 200 yards from my vehicle. And the recorder that I have it on was at my feet. So for it to record what it recorded as loud as it recorded, it would have had to been a, a really big creature because 
at 200 yards away, if you or I hollered like that, we would never hear. Wow, that's a great vocalization. Lonnie, any idea what you think that might might have been? As a, as a Bigfoot researcher in Kentucky, and hearing these animals and these creatures at nighttime, that we all know, we all know the difference between coyotes, foxes, and panthers and stuff like that. A panther would make a similar sound to that, but a panther could not make the sound as long as that, and as vocal as that, for the period of time that it made it. This this recording started at 20, started on 23 seconds and ended at 34. So. Even as a researcher, you or I would not be able to scream that long to make that noise like that. Right. Only thing that we could come up with conclusion of when we were researching this, that it could only be one thing, and that we'd actually recorded a Bigfoot in the Green River bottom of Henderson, Kentucky, related to the Spotsville encounters from years ago that's still encountering today. Lonnie and others have investigated around the Green River area for years. On one late night, he and his research team believe that they actually caught a glimpse of one of these creatures staring back at them while they were in their truck. Lonnie took this picture with his phone out of the driver's side window. You can see what appears to be eye shine from some tall creature. Whatever this is, it is just feet away from their vehicle. On another night after staking out the woods near Green River, they returned to their truck to find this strange print on one of the windows. To this day, they still have no conclusive explanation for it. Lonnie took us to meet a man who has had several sightings of the Spotsville monster in this general area of the Green River. Dustin Vitter does a lot of coon hunting with his dog Dixie and has had several run-ins with a creature that he just can't explain. We're walking out of there got the light on and got Dixie in my hand, got her on a lead rather. I get the notion as she's walking, she'll look to her right. Take two or three steps, look to her right, and two or three, and we'll look to her right. This goes on for a little bit, I'm going to say five minutes. We get to the bottom of the holler and I realize Dixie is now really looking hard to her right. I look up and the field we're in right now, matter of fact, has about six or seven head of horses in it. I look up and all the horses are right on the fence and they're all looking the same direction my dog is looking. And I'm looking out where she's looking I can't get no eye shine. The light just ain't strong enough. I just look my finger off and I see movement. Something kind of leans like this like I can see the trees block. And I'm thinking, okay, we didn't walk up on a black bear or something like that. It's just standing up, it's looking around. I get to watch for more. Like I said, the light's off now and all the horses are still looking this direction. I see it move like that, about 10 yards, and stop, and look. You can see shoulders, very, very broad shoulders. I mean, it's about four and a half foot shoulders. You can see the head. It's not all together, but you can see a very distinct head. You can see light through arms every now and then, long arms. Eight and a half, nine foot tall. Just, and it wasn't a bear, because a bear's really choppy moving. They're too top heavy. This was just fluid back and forth. I believe it came just over across the fence, then went back. Because once it hit the trail, it picked up, it was one, two, one, two, one, two, one. It picked up to a dead run. I know the ground here as well as anybody. I pretty much grew up back, you know, back on this property right here. It went down the logging road. I heard it break timber. I heard it go through Shepherd's Slew. I heard the water splashing. Hit dry ground again, and it wound up, and when it hit the creek, it sounded like a it was a big old log hitting the creek. It was just a god awful splash. And it was about 15 steps in the creek. I have no clue where I went from there because I lost it. It just got too far away. The encounter not only shook up Dustin and his wife, but it also had a major effect on his hunting dog, Dixie. It took this dog two days to quit from shaking completely. She never would hunt again. I tried, we, I tried everything I knew. My wife tried everything she knew. After that, she never was, she never was the same. Why not giving her away a couple couple months ago. Lonnie Hawks and his team heard of Dustin's story and then went to investigate the area surrounding the sighting. These are the footprints they discovered in the same exact area Dustin says 
he, his wife, and his hunting dog Dixie had a run-in with this mysterious creature, a creature that scared his dog so bad it has refused to hunt ever since. What do you think, personally, this thing is? Personally, Chris, I don't believe it's a, a flesh and blood, normal type animal that you can go out and, and hunt or kill or even track. I, I honestly believe that it's, uh, it's more of a, a supernatural type creature or it has supernatural elements. That I think that it can be physical when it wants to be, and physical enough to leave footprints and hair and scat and whatever, but when it doesn't want to be physical, I think that it, it, it isn't physical anymore and it can just disappear or reappear wherever it wants and uh, I've actually spoke to a lot of people whose uh, testimony kind of corroborates my theory on that. That's kind of a hard one for a lot of people to, to grasp. Sure it is, yeah, I realize that but it's according to my experiences uh, that's the only theory that really explains everything.